When the United States declared war against Germany in April of 1917, War Department planners quickly realized that the standing army of 126,000 men would not be enough to ensure victory overseas. The standard volunteer system proved to be inadequate in raising an army. So on May 18, 1917, Congress passed the Selective Service Act, requiring all male citizens between the ages of 21 and 31 to register for the draft. Even before the act was passed, African-American males from all over the country eagerly joined the war effort. They viewed the conflict as an opportunity to prove their loyalty, patriotism, and worthiness for equal treatment in the United States. Men of color have served in every American conflict since the Battle of Lexington in 1775. Both freemen and former slaves flocked by the thousands to wear the blue uniform of the United States in a conflict to make all men free. In 1917, men of color were ready to take up arms again. In 1917, there were four all-black regiments in the regular army, the 9th and 10th Cavalry and 24th and 25th Infantry. The men in these units were considered heroes in their communities. Within one week of Wilson's declaration of war, the War Department had to stop accepting black volunteers because the quotas for African Americans were filled. When it came to the draft, however, there was a reversal in the usual discriminatory policy. Draft boards were comprised entirely of white men. Although there were no specific segregation provisions outlined in the draft legislation, blacks were told to tear off one corner of their registration cards so they could easily be identified and inducted separately. Now, instead of turning blacks away, the draft boards were doing all they could to bring them into the service, southern draft boards in particular. One Georgia County exemption board discharged 44% of white registrants on physical grounds and exempted only 3% of black registrants based on the same requirements. It was fairly common for southern postal workers to deliberately withhold the registration cards of eligible black men and have them arrested for being draft dodgers. African-American men who owned their own farms and had families were often drafted before single white employees of large planters. Although comprising just 10% of the entire U.S. population, blacks supplied 13% of inductees. While still discriminatory, the Army was far more progressive in race relations than the other branches of the military. Blacks could not serve in the Marines and could only serve limited and menial positions in the Navy and the Coast Guard. By the end of World War I, African Americans served in cavalry, infantry, signal, medical, engineer, and artillery units, as well as serving as chaplains, surveyors, truck drivers, chemists, and intelligence officers. Although technically eligible for many positions in the Army, very few blacks got the opportunity to serve in combat units. Most were limited to labor battalions. The combat elements of the U.S. Army were kept completely segregated. The four established all-black regular Army regiments were not used in overseas combat roles, but instead were diffused throughout American-held territory. There was such a backlash from the African-American community, however, that the War Department finally created the 92nd and 93rd Divisions, both primarily black combat units, in 1917. There were two combat divisions in the uh, American Expeditionary Force. There was the 92nd Division and the 93rd Division. The 93rd was made up of three National Guard units and one unit of black draftees from the South. And the Harlem Hellfighters were the 15th New York National Guard. They became the 369th. Um, U.S. Infantry. Uh, the 8th Illinois National Guard we became the 370th U.S. Infantry. Then you had the 371st, which were the black draftees from South Carolina, I believe. And then you had the 3, 372nd, which was made up of National Guard units from Ohio, Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. Delaware, and a few other places. On the 25th of March, 1917, the 1st D.C. Battalion had been the very first National Guardsmen mustered in for federal service. They were handpicked by the Secretary of War specifically because of their race as uh, basically proof of their national origin as Americans and their loyalty to the flag, something that they couldn't guarantee in the white regiments because they had so many foreigners in their ranks. 
and of course back in those days it wasn't like now you emigrated you went back and forth and really nobody cut ties with the old country so they couldn't trust that private schultz in the umpity umph infantry regiment wasn't going to let his cousin heinrich just sort of slip in the back door of the capital and leave a bomb under the steps hence the choice of colored troops with the creation of african-american units there also came the demand for African-American officers to command the troops. The War Department thought the soldiers would be more likely to follow men of their own color, thereby reducing the risk of any sort of uprising. Most leaders of the African-American community agreed, and it was decided that the Army would create a segregated but supposedly equal officer training camp. In May 1917, Fort Des Moines opened its doors to black officer trainees. Approximately 1,250 men attended the camp in Des Moines, Iowa. Although African Americans were earning higher positions in the Army, that did not necessarily mean they were getting equal treatment. Black draftees were treated with extreme hostility when they arrived for training. White men refused to salute black officers, and black officers were often barred from the officers' clubs and quarters. The War Department rarely interceded and discrimination was usually overlooked or sometimes even condoned. Because many Southern civilians protested having blacks from other states inhabit nearby training camps, the War Department stipulated that no more than one-fourth of the trainees in any Army camp in the U.S. could be African American. After intense training, abuse by white officers, and fights with white civilians, word finally came for them to prepare for overseas duty. They were going to France to fight in the war, or so they thought. With so much trouble going on around them, the 15th New York stayed in camp and waited for official orders to send them to France and into the fight. The War Department worried about a white backlash in the army and on the home front, and didn't want the public to know they were sending blacks to fight on the Western Front. After two weeks, they boarded a troop ship named Pocahontas. The old tub was not in the best condition to transport American soldiers from New York to France. The Pocahontas set sail from the States to France three different times before it successfully made the trip across the Atlantic. Before being escorted off the ship into their camp, their commanding officer gave them two rules to be followed every second of the day. One, keep your eyes and ears open. Two, keep your mouth shut. With flags flying and the band playing the Marseille, the regiment marched through the streets of the French port of Le Havre. The black band soon became the talk of the town. This inevitably marked one of the first times jazz music was heard in France. The men soon found that they would be stationed in Saint-Nazaire, far from the front lines of war. The African-American men would work as laborers and solve more than a couple of problems for General Pershing. They were cheap workers, and they weren't wanted on their own soil or by other regiments that contained white soldiers. They felt more like stevedores than soldiers. General Pershing had little faith in the African-American regiment, with only two months of the six months of minimum training. The regiment was angry about being sent so far away from home to do labor, but what choice did they have? After a little over a year, the soldiers had turned St. Nazaire completely around, making railroads and buildings more sustainable and getting much needed supplies to troops fighting at the front. Soon the infantry learned they had been renamed from the 15th to the 369th. The new number would cause confusion and some anger, since numbers higher than 200 meant they were draftees. After all of the recruiting and volunteering the men did, the new number reflected that of soldiers who had been forced to fight for their country, despite the way they treated them at home. A soldier quoted, The 15th had died a peaceful death. Pershing, not wanting to offend white soldiers, decided to pass the 369th over to the French. Part of the reason they were attached to the French army was uh, the French needed troops. And Pershing, some of the white officers in the uh, AF didn't want 
black combat troops. So to satisfy the white officers and the, and the American Expeditionary Force, and to make the French officers happy or French army happy, he gave the French the 9th Army Division. It was later discovered that General Pershing had sent a letter to the French which was meant to be kept confidential. Although a citizen of the United States, the black man is regarded by the white American as an inferior being with whom relations of business or service only are possible. We must not commend too highly the black American troops, particularly in the presence of Americans. Make a point of keeping the native cantonment population from spoiling the Negroes. Americans become greatly incensed at any public expression of intimacy between white women with black men. Familiarity on the part of white women with black men is furthermore a source of profound regret to our experienced colonials, who see in it an overwhelming menace to the prestige of the white race. It was lucky for the now 369th Infantry that the French disregarded Pershing's orders. Ultimately, the soldiers would be grateful for being dumped. They kept their American uniforms. They turned in their Fr all their American equipment and were issued the French rifles, French, French ammunition belts, packs, uh, helmets, etc., and gas masks. But they kept their American uniforms. And actually by uh, September 1918, they started wearing the American helmet by then, before the big push. The French equipped them with new armor, uniforms, and fundamentals of the French army, even sending some troops to be educated in their war school. They better prepared the regiments for war, more so than their own country. The French order was to send a group of soldiers to the trenches at the front line for 10 days, then send in their replacements. The 9th Army Division was attached to the uh, French army. In fact, they never really fought as a division. Each, each regiment served with a different French division. The, three, the 372nd and 371st served with the 157th French Infantry Division. But since they served with the French Army and not with the American Expeditionary Force, they had a better combat, divi uh, combat record than the uh, 92nd Division did. They were finally ready for war.